everybody. I'd like to get started. Uh, my name is Dave Marcotte. I'm the director of the Washington Institute for Public Affairs Research in the School of Public Affairs, and I want to thank you all for coming today, and I want to thank uh, those of you who made this event possible and pulling, putting together all the planning, namely Rachel Trello, whom you met outside. He's, she's the program coordinator in YPAR. Uh, but I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day and coming uh, on a beautiful summer or early spring day and sitting inside a lecture hall for an hour. I appreciate that. Um, I think you're going to learn in about the next 45 minutes you made a very wise decision in, in, in how you're spending your time. But it's useful, too, to keep the outside, the weather, the, the beautiful, clear weather we're having today as a metaphor for thinking about what you're going to hear today. We're in the middle of a political season, and it, it, it doesn't take a real political junkie to know that the discussion we are having around issues of inequality, poverty, and even public policy, whether government can, can or should do anything, are hyperpartisan. Um, what you're going to hear today is, what, what you're here today to do is take shelter from the storm of that kind of dialogue. I can say with no equivocation at all that the speaker today is more qualified than anyone in the world to provide us with a fair and clear and thorough accounting of the changes and remaining challenges of poverty and inequality in the United States. Our speaker, Dr. Sheldon Danziger, has been at the forefront of research and policy advice on social policy in the United States for more than 30 years. He received his PhD in economics at MIT and then joined uh, the faculty at the School of Social Work at the University of Wisconsin. Um, after, at Wisconsin, he was then promoted a full professor and was the director of what was probably the most important institute for research on poverty in the country and the world, the IRP at, uh, at Madison for, during the 80s and 90s. He then moved to the University of Michigan where he was the Henry J. Meyer Distinguished University Professor at the Ford School of Public Policy. And during this time, he also directed the National Poverty Center at Michigan and the NIMH Research and Development Center of Poverty, Risk, and Mental Health. Uh, Dr. Danziger has authored or edited some of the most important books on social policy in the last four decades. I'll give you some examples. In the 1980s, he edited the book Fighting Poverty, What Works and What Doesn't, probably one of the most important books of that decade on the topic. In the 90s, Une Uneven Tides, Rising Inequality in America. In the 2000s, Working in Poor, How Economic Conditions and Policy Changes Affect Low-Income Workers. And in this decade, Legacies of the War on Poverty. Because you didn't come to hear me talk, I'm not going to try and summarize all of his other accomplishments, all of his journal papers and awards. Uh, they're far too numerous and long in, in, for me to, to cover here. But he did serve, importantly, as a, on the White House uh, Domestic Policy Council on Poverty, and he's an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So it's not surprising, uh, in the least, when the Russell Sage Foundation needed a new president after many uh, years under Eric Wanner's leadership uh, in 2013, that Sheldon Danziger was the ideal choice. RSF, the Russell Sage Foundation, is one of the oldest foundations in the United States, founded at the end of the Gilded Age, uh, with a mission to, and I quote, the improvement of social and living conditions in the United States. More than 100 years later, it's among the most important forces devoted to, to the use of social science to di diagnose social problems and improve social policies. So I can think of no one better equipped uh, than Sheldon Danziger to lead that effort and to help clarify what we know and help diagnose current problems and implement research to advance knowledge and divide so devise social policy based on that evidence. So I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sheldon Danziger. Thanks, Dave. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, That's an outline of what I want to talk about. I um, used to give an introduction to talks like this saying that um, most current public policy discourse uh, acts as if a rising tide lifts all boats, uh, as it did in the quarter century after World War II. 
uh, just dial back a year or two, I would say that, and I have this introduction, say, but now, um, you know, it hasn't worked that way despite what people say. And just a few days ago, I was reading David Brooks in the New York Times, and he said, a rising tide no longer lifts all boats. Globalization, technological change, family changes, the Republicans don't get it. So maybe the first part of the talk is obsolete now if um, um, David Brooks uh, has bought onto this. But um, when Peter Gottschalk and I were working on Uneven Tides, which was an edited volume, and then we did a book a few years later, America Unequal, the uh, reaction among many economists was, well, uh, yes, the returns to education have shifted, so that's causing increased inequality. There'll quickly be a supply response, and this increase in inequality is likely to be short-lived. So um, the part of the talk that we're now in an era of inequality is not, um, uh, is not as new. But I think the policy implications um, are just as important. And what I want to do, and I'll be sure to leave time for questions, is talk a little bit about the war on poverty era, why I think um, um, the war on poverty planners got it right, uh, the change in policies in the Reagan era, and then implications for what we ought to do going forward. And because it's a public policy school, I'm going to end talking about a report that came out of an AEI Brookings working group called Opportunity, Responsibility, and Security. And you can download it for free from either Brookings or AEI. Because what I want to do is talk about what I think ought to be done, and then uh, which obviously is based on my interpretation of uh, the research and policy experience, but then talk about uh, this AEI Brookings report because um, it involved a set of compromises by people who uh, identify as progressive and people who identify as conservatives. And I was on, I was one of the members of this working group because I think it does show that uh, if we lived in a world in which um, people, um, policy analysts, uh, reacted um, to the research, uh, they could come up with a compromise agenda that I think um, is a realistic agenda. Uh, my agenda, I don't think, is quite realistic, I'm assuming. Uh, Bernie Sanders is not going to be uh, president, but uh, the interesting thing about the AEI Brookings report is that nobody liked it. And I think that's an important thing for policy uh, uh, students in training to realize because those of us on the progressive th side thought we gave too much up and those people who were on the conservative side thought they gave too much up. But I actually think standing back from this, it's a model for maybe how things used to be, but unfortunately uh, how they're not uh, these days. So let me just start with a quote from the economic report of the president in 1964. Um, and the key line at the bottom, uh, is general prosperity and growth leave untouched many of the roots of human poverty? So the notion that economic growth on its own was sufficient uh, to reduce poverty was at the core of the war on poverty. Um, you'll see in policy discourse continuing to the present that the way to reduce poverty is to get government out of the way and let unleash the forces of the market and uh, if we could only get GDP growth up to 5% a year, uh, then we wouldn't have to worry uh, about government programs. And I think um, if you go back and read the material that the uh, War on Poverty researchers were uh, involved with, you'll see these were uh, some people who clearly understood the economy. Uh, Bob Solo was a staff economist. 
uh, at the Council of Economic Pro uh, Advisors, later a uh, Nobel Prize winner. Jim Tobin was a member of the Council, later a Nobel Prize winner, and both of them uh, clearly thought uh, growth was important. Solo obviously got his Nobel Prize because of economic growth theory, but they thought that growth wasn't enough. The other thing that uh, is important, uh, and I'm just going to be skimming over this, is these are sort of the issues that the 1964 report emphasized. A lot of people say, oh, the war on poverty was all about giving handouts. Um, it was about uh, welfare and food stamps. Uh, it really was mainly about uh, human capital, but a, a range of issues. Uh, and in the book, Dave mentioned uh, Legacies of the War on Poverty, which I co-edited with Martha Bailey, an economic historian. She particularly has done some research and research of, of others about the importance of the Johnson administration's linking the war on poverty uh, uh, to fighting discrimination um, uh, as a key aspect of it. So um, the war on poverty was broad. Um, these are basically some, an oversimplification, uh, but I think it very much shapes what most progressives have thought for the last 50 years. Economic growth is necessary but not sufficient. Uh, the poor are born in the wrong place or to the wrong parents, and just in the last year or so, there's been uh, more research by Raj Chetty and colleagues, uh, Pat Sharkey and others, economic sociology and other fields, showing the importance of neighborhoods and uh, a long history showing um, um, uh, unequal educational opportunities and, and transmission of, um, of opportunity across generations. Uh, I have this quote. Uh, it turns out Bob Solo was a member of the President's Commission on Eco Income Maintenance. And this is the um, closest, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, a government document you can find that sounds like um, a Scandinavian welfare state. Uh, our main recommendation is for creation of a universal income supplement program financed by the federal government. In some sense, what we have that evolved is the food stamp program operates this way, but in food stamps and with a much lower benefit than they had in mind. And the SSI program for the elderly, blind, and disabled works the same way. But this was basically the endorsement of the negative income tax, which uh, economists ranging from Milton Friedman to Jim Tobin, everybody in between, I think was uh, uh, very supportive of in the 60s uh, and 70s. Um, the, um, as I mentioned, uh, this era of optimism that led uh, Tobin and uh, one of my mentors from Wisconsin, <coughs> Robert Lampman, to both predict that poverty would be eliminated uh, by 1980. Uh, Tobin actually had a piece in, I think it was the New Republic, saying it would be eliminated by the bicentennial in uh, 1976, was because they thought this golden age of economic growth, which had characterized the country from the end of World War II to um, uh, while they were writing in the late 60s in the early 70s. They thought that would continue and that the programs and policy put in place by the war on poverty would then be sufficient because you had this rapid economic growth, shared prosperity, now you focus programs and policies on the poor. Uh, and again, particularly the um, uh, linking of civil rights to these activities uh, would um, um, greatly increase opportunity and reduce poverty. Um, since then, as I said, I, you know, these may be, um, uh, it's now, this is all very well known, but uh, obviously uh, this period ended uh, in the early 1970s, uh, and even though um, 
um, a lot of it had to do with rapid uh, economic growth. There were also public policies, so this was a period in which uh, the minimum wage uh, was rising relative to inflation. Uh, there was the expansion of employer-provided uh, health insurance and pensions. So uh, the government and employers were also doing things that were promoting um, um, the spreading of prosperity. And one of the first projects I worked on when I was a postdoc at Wisconsin at the Institute for Research on Poverty relates to the last two bullets. Uh, it was, why if poverty is falling so rapidly, is inequality falling so slowly? So that's a topic that you won't um, see much about. And I don't think we understood very much about it. Uh, but the issue was that poverty had fallen rapidly in the post-war era, but inequality had only fallen uh, a little bit. Uh, obviously, since then, we've had um, um, a period in which the poverty rate is, uh, has, the official poverty rate has never been below the 1973 rate, which, by the way, was announced in the fall of 1974, my first year as a postdoc. So my entire academic career has been one of which uh, uh, poverty and inequality were higher than when I started. And uh, I used to have an uncle, now deceased, who when I was a younger scholar, used to, he was more conservative, used to say, maybe you should stop studying this and <laughs> poverty will um, go back down. And I tried to explain to him about correlation and causation, but <laughs> he would laugh and walk across the other room, to the other side of the room. Um, so again, this is all well known. I'll, I'll uh, show uh, one chart which I think says it all. Um, I wrote a little piece about this in um, the um, IRP Focus, and I'm blanking on the name. Somebody at EPI now updates this that Peter Gottschalk and I had done. But basically, uh, let's see, if, is this the light? So, this is the period when the war on poverty is launched, and this is the period when people like Lampman and Tobin are saying by 1980 there won't be any poverty. And basically, they were just assuming that this was going to keep going up. And you can imagine if this goes up in, I don't know, the real earnings today, instead of being uh, the same as they were uh, in 1973, were doubled, there would be a lot less poverty. If <laughs> the median wage was double. And the reason I think this is important because it's the median earning of full-time workers, so they don't get UI, they're not uh, getting food stamps, they're not being lulled into idleness by the safety net, which some people would argue is why poverty is high. And you know, if anybody had said in the early 1970s, you know, the war on poverty is gonna fail because uh, economic growth is no longer going to trickle down, people would have thought, you know, what have you been smoking? Uh, so it just, uh, and in some sense, it's, uh, as I say, it's only fairly recently that there's now this realization um, that it's gone on long enough, it's uh, not likely to be uh, self-correcting. Um, again, uh, this is well known to people on the subject, but uh, hidden behind that chart of uh, roughly a stable median is inflation-adjusted medians for people with a high school degree or less or down, and there is an increase uh, for those with a BA and, and advanced degrees, and some of the data uh, is updated in this AEI uh, Brookings book, which shows changes for both men and women uh, over this long period of town time. Uh, this is a very simple picture, which uh, sort of is a characterization of what it means to go from a period in which a rising tide lifts all boats into one in which uh, there's slow growth and rising inequality. And basically, all you have to see is that 
The bars on the left are all big. They're, in fact, all of them are much bigger than the ones on the right, but basically they're pretty much the same, and that is in the post-war era there was a doubling of inflation-adjusted income for those at the bottom and those at the top, and even those at the top had slightly less growth, and that's why there was slightly falling inequality uh, during this period. And on the right, a very nice, colorful stepladder, uh, but that means that the people on the bottom have very, very little growth, and these are over very long periods. And I think there's probably almost universal agreement about this. There is one researcher, uh, Scott Winship, who's at the Manhattan Institute, who can show that these data from the census don't include health insurance benefits. If you include health insurance benefits and you um, um, use a different price deflator, you can show that there actually has been modest growth in the real earnings of full-time, full-year workers over this 40-year period, and you get less inequality than these data show. So I'm going to jump ahead a second uh, so that I can move on to the policy discussion. So um, the, uh, I'd say the end of the era uh, in which uh, the war on poverty um, um, views um, were accepted as part of national policy was in the Carter administration. The Low Income Energy Assistance Program, I guess called LIHEAP, came in uh, in the late 1970s under Carter and it fit the war on poverty's uh, uh, the uh, planners of the war on poverty's notion of uh, what does it do for the poor. So uh, the idea was we're going to uh, deregulate energy prices because that'll be more efficient. But when you deregulate, you have to worry about people at the bottom and uh, who won't be able to absorb the price increase. And that's when we got that, let what I would consider the last program of the war on poverty. Um, the Reagan era begins, uh, obviously, before 1986, but this is really uh, Reagan's restatement of Charles Murray's view, which I'd say is the dominant view today, certainly uh, in the Paul Ryan um, interpretation of the last 50 years of um, poverty policy. And, um, the argument is not the one I've been giving, which it's a failure of economic growth, but rather it's government is counterproductive. Poverty is one in part because of helping the poor, government programs ruptured the bonds holding poor families together. And probably the most recent version of this is a book by Casey Mulligan, which blames, he's a Chicago economist, which blames the recession uh, that began in 2008 on a minimum wage increase uh, in 2007 and which uh, a higher minimum wage led workers to want more leisure relative to labor. Um, so government in that world is always uh, counterproductive. Uh, in this view, the poor lack personal responsibility. They don't take advantage of available job opportunities. Uh, government programs exacerbate the problem. And then more important, money alone won't cure poverty. So the war on poverty was really about raising living standards. And this period is one in which um, the view comes in that uh, it, it's not money. There's something more fundamental. And if you read Brooks, he has both that the um, um, economy has broken down, but also that the family has broken down, and that's often the, the uh, other side, and I'll, our report comes back to both of them, which is why I want to talk about that. Um, and then this quote uh, from a working group in 1987 is uh, shifts the uh, emphasis to 
uh, personal responsibility, money alone will not cure poverty, internal values are also needed. Uh, the most disturbing element among a fraction of the contemporary poor is the inability to seize opportunity when it is available while others around them uh, are seizing it. And so this is very much turning on its head that quote from the President's Commission on Income Maintenance which said the problem is opportunities aren't available. Here the argument is opportunities available, the poor won't avail themselves. And uh, this was well stated in a point counterpoint sometime in the 80s when I was still at Wisconsin, uh, Larry Mead and uh, William Julius Wilson. William Julius Wilson says the problem is there are no jobs in the inner city, they've moved to the suburbs, or the employers won't hire, uh, particularly black males, so it's a problem of jobs aren't available uh, to inner city residents, and Mead would say no, the jobs are there, they just won't take them at the available wage, and given their skills, they're not uh, going to get an employer to give them a higher wage. It's uh, unwillingness to seize uh, these opportunities. Um, and the reason I emphasize both these views is because when I, when I come to the AEI Brookings report, we tried to uh, accept both of them, and, it, and I'll just to preview, uh, I first uh, debated Larry Mead in 1987, and I don't think Larry and I ever agreed on anything having to do with poverty um, and welfare reform, yet both of us signed off on this report because of the way uh, the things were worded. And basically, um, the I'm jumping ahead, but it, it's fitting here. Uh, we ought to, here's the argument. You'll hear it a, a lot um, uh, because it's uh, part of uh, the Paul Ryan view. Uh, the problem with food stamps is uh, it allows people not to work. And so we really need to work test food stamps. And uh, the conservatives on the group really believe that, that uh, people are uh, turning down available jobs. Now the food stamp benefit, uh, Brad, what's the food stamp benefit for a single person? Where's Bradley? With, with no income, $150 a month? Pretty, pretty modest. Pretty modest, yeah. Somebody must know. It's what? 150 a month. Okay, so people actually believe they're turning down jobs. But so as part of the compromise, we said, okay, we're willing to move somewhat forward on having work requirements and safety net programs as long as there is a work opportunity uh, and you can't be kicked off the program without being offered a work opportunity. So we crafted the language and I, I may or may not have an exact copy of the sentence in my slides. And basically the issue was I believe jobs are not available and that there are lots of people who would take jobs if they are offered. So, and I actually think in the Clinton welfare reform, the original Elwood vision was not two years and out, but two years in work. Uh, and I think most people who've looked at it would say if you have a work requirement coupled with a work opportunity, you're going to spend a lot more money uh, than you would just giving benefits. So the progressives in our group were happy to sign on to an increased responsibility as long as there's increased opportunity. And Larry said, well, I just don't think so. I think you're going to tell people they have to work and they're going to find out that they're living with people, that they're working off the books. They're just not going to take these jobs. So I'm willing to sign on because I don't think uh, anybody is going to take it and therefore it won't cost much. Uh, so that's how these divergent views uh, actually came together. Now, um, it would obviously depend on how it's implemented and uh, what it costs, but uh, you know, uh, if we lived in a world in which uh, government was willing to experiment like they did in the old days with the negative income tax experiments and the health insurance experiments, we would be able to do something like this and uh, find out. 
So um, to sort of summarize where I am, and as I said, this is uh, uh, many of, if many of these things are accepted by David Brooks, uh, they're uh, not very controversial. But it also leads me to be pessimistic about uh, the future prospects uh, because this has gone on for a long time. Um, skill bias technological changes are still in our future. In fact, um, the Russell Sage program has a future of work program and we've begun uh, looking at the implication of automation and robotics for the future of work. There are some people who predict that half the jobs will be gone um, um, in 10 years if you're a technology optimist, 25 years if you're a technology pessimist. Uh, globalization of markets, decline in unionization, changes in employer practices, and erosion of the minimum wage. The fact that we've had very few years of full employment, which is something that the war on poverty planners thought uh, was going to be the case. There's a famous quote from Nixon, uh, we're all Keynesians now, so they thought they knew how to tame the business cycle. Um, and then obviously uh, declining progressivity of federal income tax, explosion of executive pay. I was saying at one of the sessions with faculty this, this morning that um, the endowment of the Russell Sage Foundation is 300 million, which is small compared to something like the Gates Foundation, which is 30 billion, but that's obviously a big foundation. <laughs> but it turns out it's small relative to the net worth of many um, uh, hedge fund and Wall Street types. And while I was taking a break in Dave's office and just scrolling uh, through the news, I saw that uh, at least uh, two people from Google, one had made $100 million last year and one's getting $100 million this year. So already their annual income of two people in two years is two-thirds of the uh, Russell Sage Endowment. So this explosion of executive pay uh, certainly is a relatively new phenomenon that the war on poverty uh, planners certainly would not have thought about it. Um, because I don't have time, this slide is just to tell you that I really know what the research is about and there are other things going on including immigration and family structure changes. Uh, there are many people, uh, I'd say, um, uh, Isabel Sawhill, uh, who's certainly a progressive researcher, believes that uh, non-out-of-wedlock childbearing and single-mother households are a very serious cause of poverty. Um, um, I'm not saying that family changes aren't important, but uh, there are also a lot of family changes uh, that are poverty-reducing, and in fact, in work Gottschalk and I did that um, I think it's Elise Gould at EPI who has been updating that uh, the role of demographic changes are relatively small relative to the role of slow growth and, and rising inequality. That is the fact that wages no longer rise in tandem for those at the top and the bottom. So the um, current economic climate is pretty dim. Um, there's, uh, the last time we had any real wage growth uh, for those at the bottom was the late 1990s. Um, we're seven years into an economic recovery uh, and um, obviously uh, income and wealth inequalities remain very large and um, um, there um, still are uh, many people who think that uh, the most important thing we need to do is uh, to reduce uh, the deficit. I'll briefly say something about welfare reform. Um, at the 10-year anniversary of welfare reform, I was much more optimistic than I was now. And in fact, um, in the current context, uh, you'll hear, well, we need to do for food stamps what we did uh, for welfare reform, 
That is, we put in a work test. Um, and one of the key, I think, misinterpretations, it's, it's that uh, you can blame the war on poverty instead of blaming uh, the economy for what went wrong, and you can uh, give credit to welfare reform and not the economy for what went right. Um, clearly, welfare reform was important. I, I agree with conservatives that uh, not as many people would have left welfare and gone to work had it not been for the strong emphasis on personal responsibility. But uh, once we got past uh, the period of rapid economic growth starting in the early 2000s, the situation uh, has deteriorated and uh, anybody who's read $2 a day by Luke Schaefer or Kathy Eden or Matt Desmond's new book on evicted know that this problem of the increasing number of disconnected uh, mothers who have no work and no welfare, and in many cases are living only on food stamps, um, is a result of having a work requirement without uh, a work opportunity attached to it. So uh, here are what I conclude, if I, if I weren't racing through this and had the whole time, I would have spent a little bit more time on this, but I want to get to the AEI. These are some of the things which I consider modest policy recommendations. Um, subsidized job programs for those willing to work at the minimum wage who can't find an employer who will hire them. And in my view, there's enough evidence to say that the long-term unemployed welfare recipients uh, and released prisoners uh, are uh, much more likely uh, to find uh, there are no jobs available than it to be the case that they really don't want to work because um, uh, food stamps are uh, so attractive. Um, I'll also mention expand the EITC for childless low-wage workers, which seems to be very popular. Both Paul Ryan and President Obama have endorsed this in one form or the other, but uh, one side wants to pay for it with cuts in social programs and one side wants to pay for it with tax increases so it doesn't move anywhere. Um, and so I'll just, um, I'll leave those. Uh, and then the real issue is why um, did I and the other people on this task force from the progressive side uh, sign on? And it really was because we decided that there was a need to sort of demonstrate the importance of compromise. Um, and uh, out of the blue, I got a letter. There was a group that had formed, uh, and it said, uh, uh, I'll read this, I have to step back. We forswear ideological purity. We understand that the need to, to compromise and work together means that the final report is unlikely to be entirely acceptable to anyone. And you know, I read that at the time. That didn't resonate. It turns out that was exactly right. <laughs> um, and then, um, uh, we actually worked together uh, and came up with these, uh, I guess, memes, opportunity, responsibility, and security. Uh, obviously, everybody agrees that there ought to be more opportunity. Conservatives are concerned about responsibility. Progressives are concerned uh, about security. But we wove this in uh, so, um, is have this bottom line, Americans can meet their responsibility with an adequate social safety net uh, for those who, who truly need it. And it was interesting, I guess this is one of the things that, why it might be hard for Congress to do this. The last time I remember Congress doing something like this uh, was in uh, a budget agreement under George Bush the father when part of the compromise was that he raised taxes. Um, and that only led to the no new taxes uh, pledge. But as an example of the difference, um, the Social Security Commission from the early 80s, which was called the Greenspan Commission, successfully pushed 
without Social Security's <coughs> solvency by 20 or 30 years. I don't know the details. But it basically included a set of small tax increases and small benefit reductions. So um, I don't know, do the young people in this room know that uh, their Social Security retirement age is 67? That was one of the things that was slowly done. Uh, for my cohort, it's 66. Uh, and uh, the there were modest tax increases. So my colleague, Ned Gramlich, who was on the faculty at Michigan, the head of the Congressional Budget Office, and then a commissioner, uh, a member of the federal, the governor of the Federal Reserve Board, a very distinguished academic, uh, headed a similar commission 10 to 12 years later. And Ned is the, unfortunately he's deceased, he was the consummate policy analyst. I mean, he just was Mr. Policy Analysis. He wrote a book on benefit cost. He was a serious scholar. He was seriously engaged in public policy. And I can remember once when he was back in, and he said, I've got it. I've got a set of modest benefit reductions and modest tax increases, and this will help push Social Security solvency out another 20, 30 years, whatever. And so he came to the School of Public Policy, he gave a talk, and all of us nodded, and that seemed right. When he got to the report, he got two votes. Ned and somebody else, it was because people on the side who were progressive said, I like your tax increases, but I can't sign on to anything that has a benefit cut, and vice versa on the other side. And so this model plan from the standpoint of uh, a policy analyst went nowhere, and we haven't done any serious um, uh, changes to Social Security uh, since, uh, really, the Greenspan Commission. So um, I just, uh, I want to make sure I stop for questions. Um, what we did is we ended up saying, okay, there are three things. We have to do them all at once. Uh, we have to focus on family, work, and education. And both of them were a mix of um, uh, things that um, both sides thought were important. So, I mean, almost everybody agrees that we need to improve skills to get well-paying jobs, um, but make work pay more for the less educated, um, raise work levels among the hard to employ, including the poorly, poorly educated and those with criminal records, and assure that jobs are available. So, when put together like this, people who had the view well, the problem with the poor is they just won't take available jobs. And those of us who thought the poor's problem is employers just won't hire them, there are no available jobs, were able to come together on this kind of language. And I'll just scroll through quickly. You can see the same thing on families. This was the one that was probably the most contentious. Um, um, but again, um, um, the uh, emphasis on responsibility, um, the, the, one of the arguments is if we could have anti-smoking campaigns, uh, we could have uh, uh, similar kind of public service campaigns about uh, don't have kids until you're uh, able to responsibly parent them. But then we also have in the family chapter, it's important to help young, less educated, and women prosper and work in family, and then we refer to the job opportunities, saying, but if you can't support a family, uh, that's a family problem as well as a work problem. And the same thing, we have these kinds of um, um, uh, balanced uh, positions in um, uh, the education area. And then finally, and this will be my last slide, what we did uh, was we avoided detailed numbers because we obviously weren't the uh, Congressional Budget Office, but we did the kind of thing that the Greenspan Commission did and that my colleague Ned Gramlich wanted to do, is we basically 
said uh, that we should both cut spending uh, and raise revenue. And this is the kind of thing that gets uh, very difficult. Uh, as I say, you can get agreement between Paul Ryan and President Obama that we ought to have an EITC uh, for uh, single people, but if you have to get the money somewhere, our group uh, was willing to suggest uh, changes uh, in uh, both spending uh, and, and raising revenue. So I guess I want to close by saying uh, while in general I think the prospects are um, uh, dim for actually getting uh, uh, much in the way of uh, poverty and inequality, reducing poverty, given the current political uh, situation, one can hope uh, that, that reasonable people uh, could uh, sit down and uh, come up with uh, a set of policies that uh, from one side don't go far enough, from another side might go too far, um, um, but um, there's a role for uh, policy analysis, if only for as an academic exercise showing that uh, this kind of compromise, um, which would, uh, I think both sides uh, agreed would uh, be an improvement over the status quo that, that moving uh, forward um, uh, was something that was possible. So let me stop there and I'll be happy to take questions. sets of recommendations, policy recommendations, because I think they're, they're aspirations, they're not policy recommendations. Could you put them back up, the, the economic one? Can you start? This one? Yeah. So this presumably, this assumes we know how to improve skills to get well-paying jobs. Do we? I mean, it's an aspiration everyone would agree with. It, it's, it's true of assure that jobs are available. If everyone agreed that that was the case, how could you not agree? How do you do that? Well, I, you know, the rep, I, it's I'm it's just- true with all of those. So I obviously just gave you the summary sound bite. So let me just say, um, on the first part, there is a specific discussion about ways to change um, community college uh, programs. Harry Holzer was a member of our group. I think his work on education and training programs is well known. Um, so I would say scan through the report because we do try to be much more specific. This is, is showing the overview and, and I can see now having just pulled this out uh, why it sounds like vacuous, but I think in each area there are specific suggestions about uh, specific programs and policies. Um, so I, I would just say it's more specific and uh, wherever possible we tried to mention the empirical results of programs that have either been randomly evaluated or there's pretty good empirical estimates otherwise. But on the first one, I don't want to make a fetish of this. The improved skills to get well-paying guys strikes me that the problem there is fundamentally at the elementary and secondary school level. I agree that community colleges are excellent 
devices that can be improved. But the, ma the major problem is prior to that. I'm not sure we know how to deal with it. Well, I'll refer you to the report, but again, it was surprising to me that you could get uh, conservatives to agree, close resource gaps to reduce education gaps. So there is a focus in the education chapter on early education. Um, we couldn't get an endorsement for universal preschool, but there's discussion of states might want to look at the states that have adopted universal preschool. So I, I think the report um, uh, is not vacuous. <laughs> so I've been asked for those who, with, who have, want to ask questions that to please share the microphone. Um, I'll let you how, call on people. How's that? <laughs> Just a moment, but I'm going to ask a question. Um, since I have the, since I have a microphone right here, and that is uh, related to it's related to Hal's question. I, I you know you, when you you showed the the slide with the rising incomes through the 60s and early 70s, and it was easy to forecast then that if we could just sort of get people onto a rickety boat, throw them in the water, they'd rise, right? And it, I, it 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 strikes me that what's on the table now is so much harder. Not now we have to change. The, the mechanism that determines the way water ebbs and flows, if, that's a, that's, if I'm taking your metaphor and, and totally slaughtering it. But we're trying to fix an economy and fix, uh, that's a much, much bigger lift. Yeah, so no, I, and, it, I, I that's why, and, and that's why um, the technology optimist, I have actually heard technology optimist who I'm referring to people who think it's inevitable that in a very short time uh, there won't be any taxi drivers, they'll all be Google driverless cars, and there won't be any truck drivers, they'll all be driverless trucks. Right. Um, I heard somebody quite intelligent say, well, um, we just have uh, a guaranteed annual income, and we'll give everybody who turns 18 a certain amount of money a year. You know, it's sort of like, whoa, it's a negative income tax where you don't worry about uh, the labor supply effects, and you know, that, that seems pretty um, uh, daunting. Right. Um, somebody like Frank Levy, who you obviously know, your dissertation advisor, I call more a technology realist, and he thinks there will be more uh, technology that will displace labor, but not as much as the optimist, uh, because some of it will be um, people working alongside machines. Um, so for example, um, your doctor will have, uh, when your doctor reads an x-ray, he or she won't be relying on the 10,000 they've seen, but rather there'll be a computer program which will say it's 80% likely to be this and 15% likely. So that mm. it would have access to 100 million right. Uh, scans that have been read in and therefore it will improve the diagnosis you get from the physician. It's not going to displace the physician. Mm. Um, but with machines that work that quickly, you might have fewer physicians. So, but, it, but clearly, it, if you take any credence to the notion that, I mean, it relates to what Hal said about well-paying jobs, uh, these arguments are there'll even be fewer jobs. Uh, than one could possibly uh, imagine now. We have a question in the back. Yeah, that, that was essentially my question, and I was going to uh, uh, relate it in relation to a new book by McChesney called People Get Ready, and he uses the driverless car uh, problem as an example of that. But I also, I also wanted to just quickly introduce myself. I'm, my name is Leslie Durier, and I am a a co-raconteur of a thing called democorpacy, which is essentially cooperatives that usurp capitalist uh, dynamics to grow very quickly and replace a lot of the companies that really rely upon ourselves. You know, we're kind of in a new economy that's not industrially focused. And to the question, we need to really take a, a different kind of a focus, like Dave was saying, one that's politically oriented, and I think why the young people aren't the young people and uh, disgruntled people following Trump and Bernie because they, they kind of realize the, the scope of the change that we're facing? 
the one thing I want to say about the Google car related back to what Frank Levy had said. So I'm just, um, I know this because Russell Sage put a little money into a project bringing the ro people who actually do the robots with economists. And Frank said something like the following. It's true that the Google car is already safer than people, but the issue is we are humanly adjusted to the fact that we will wake up and read that a drunk ran through a playground and killed a bunch of people. That happens, unfortunately, a lot. But we're not yet ready to have the Google car do it. And so there's some, his view is that it has to be so much better than humans. But in any case, that's, um, the, that's the argument for why it will actually take a little longer than the optimists, uh, than the optimists think. Uh, Sheldon, so we've got 20 years now uh, you know, since welfare reform, and I guess I wonder in your list of policy prescriptions and ideas, you had a pretty detailed set of bullet points, sort of what you think to be the most effective of the bullet points and then maybe the most realistic. And, you know, I, I'd even comment that I'm pretty excited about the prospect of people thinking about jobs of last resort. Um, at the same time, I, I suspect that that might be uh, the heaviest lift. And, and so, you know, I guess I wanted you to comment on how we might get at um, some sort of set of triggers. I know that in the food stamp program, we've had uh, local unemployment statistics that could potentially turn on longer benefits. But at the same time, that, that raises problems because you might have people whose economic prospects don't, don't flow with the, the local unemployment rate. So uh, just thought you'd maybe comment on you know, what we might hope to expect 20 years out if the conversation on uh, welfare reform, uh, which hasn't been altered at all, really, um, comes back up. Well, I think, and this relates to something specific in this report, both sides thought the TANF emergency fund that was in the stimulus bill was a good idea. And unfortunately, there, was no, there were no formal research evaluations of that, but basically, Something like $5 billion was allocated and states had to put up a very small amount. And some states subsidized employers, other states did other things. And so that, I think people agreed that was a model uh, and that could serve as the kind of model um, that um, would allow you to try it again and, let, and this time evaluate and see when you offer people jobs, how many will show up. And I think I mentioned the Robin Hood Foundation in New York City and the city of New York are talking about possibly doing a randomized trial of jobs of last resort. Uh, so it would be great if we actually get some experimentation. And essentially what's happening these days are as I said, experiments that the federal government would have done aren't getting done. And to the extent they're being done, they're being done by uh, individual researchers. I mentioned Raj Chetty, who has this important work uh, implying that the neighborhood you live in as a child is very important. He's actively engaged with public housing authorities and is in trying to raise money to actually run some demonstration projects uh, where um, they would, housing authorities are giving out Section 8 vouchers every year, but they basically have a lot of discretion in how they can do that, and he's trying to get them to say, okay, maybe in this area we'll say, we'll randomly assign, we've got 400 vouchers to give out this year, 200, you can do whatever you want, which is the current policy. The other 200, you can only use them if you find a neighborhood with a lower poverty rate and will help you find housing in those areas. So I think we may be getting a set of experiments uh, in a number of these areas, which you know it takes five or 10 years for one of these experiments to really show up, but we haven't had uh, much in the way. I mean, you can, welfare reform experiments were done a lot between the Reagan era and 96. MDRC had done a lot of them. 
And then since then, they've done a lot of community college ones because that's where there's been some funding from IES, the Institute for Educational Sciences, to, to do. So I think a lack of experimentation is part of the problem in the current environment. I mean, as people point out, we launched Medicare and Medicaid without an experiment. Um, and we launched a lot of things without experiments. Um, to preface my question, I took a class on poverty while I was studying abroad last semester in Santiago, Chile. So the perspective of this might be a little different, but essentially my question for you is, in this report, which I haven't read yet, but I, I definitely will after this talk, um, we talked a lot in our class about the different perspectives into poverty, and I noticed that your report focused more on the economic perspective, but in terms of being socially poor, being politically poor, for example, someone who might have you know, the wealth and but they, you know, they are not able to vote, like, and how that poverty is kind of comes through a different lens. So I was curious in your work, have you guys focused on those different perspectives? Is that a research for the future? I know it's not as essential in the United States where we think of those things intrinsically linked, but in terms of applying this to a broader scope, is it something that you guys considered? Well, I think some of it is the U.S. context and, um, the war on poverty era, which I was emphasizing the origins, uh, the Johnson administration also was very active in uh, promoting voter rights, civil rights, and I think the war on poverty planners on that end, it's not that it would be quite surprised at the change in voter laws that have taken place. The nobody, uh, predicted the role of uh, the extent to which so many uh, low-income men in particular would have criminal records, and that makes it's bad enough to be a high school dropout in the labor market to be a high school dropout with a criminal record. So there are uh, issues around social participation, voting, um, that are quite relevant, but I, my, my talk was really based on certain set of research focusing on either safety net programs or economic growth. We have time for one, one last question. <laughs> so let me first apologize. I have not had a chance to, to read the report, but I, I've, I've heard the term displacement uh, used several times in talking about the investment, the needed public investment, in both preschool and post-secondary. Um, in another way, though, couldn't the displacement be you, you are continuing to have, albeit uh, with the introduction of like common core curriculum, um, an inefficient primary and secondary education that is not yet really being addressed in most economic reports that also has like a major public finance um, uh, element to it at the local level with what property values are. Um, in terms of this this emphasis upon post-secondary, I myself, I'm in grad school right now, and I can honestly say that throughout my undergraduate career, the vast majority of internship opportunities, the vast majority of job opportunities were either incredibly low paying until upon conferral of that degree or entirely unfunded. So I think there's potentially, and I'd love to hear your reaction to it, um, this displacement in terms of we're now looking at not being employed necessarily at age 18 or even 20, but more like 25. So there's an awful lot there. I'll just yeah. comment <laughs> on um, the evolution of unpaid internships and ha how unfair they are is a relatively recent phenomenon. I'll just answer it with an anecdote. Um, before I left Michigan um, to go to Russell Sage, the Ford School has started an undergraduate public policy program. And this was, I think, the spring of 2009. And I had two students who had applied to be interns uh, somewhere in the Obama administration. So I don't remember the pro I remember writing the letters and both of them got in, 
and one person was from an affluent family and it didn't matter that it wasn't paid and the other person was from a poor single mother family and it ma mattered a lot and you know you think what are the implications for your future whether going to graduate school or getting job having worked in the Obama administration out of college so it turned out Michigan was able to do something around the books, but the, the person who couldn't afford to was hired to do something for the University of Michigan, which allowed her to work from a distance. And I was once giving a talk uh, for the Domestic Policy Council, and she came up to me and you know was there, and then she's since gone on to grad school. So that's just another example of how things it's like changing employer practices. Uh, when I ran the Poverty Center in Michigan, we wouldn't take unpaid interns. I said, you know, if we have a job, we're going to um, pay for them, and we're not going to, because it was sort of unfair to let people who could sign on for the summer without, if, if you did that, then you'd be getting the disproportionate number of affluent people. And, and the first part of your question was uh, on, on K-12, the Research Institute YPAR, we had a, 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 a session on K-12 education last semester. So uh, next semester, we're going to have a session on crime. So look forward to seeing you there. I'm sorry to have to cut off the questions. We have a reception outside. I know there are other questions. Please, everyone, retreat outside, have some food, and you can ask and talk to Sheldon and ask your questions directly. So thanks very much to Sheldon Danziger. For <laughs>